I've heard it said that leaders can only lead by consent of the people. But it's not always what it seems, because sometimes the leaders can lie to the people, confuse them, and even lead them astray without the people even realizing it. Recently, I have heard two pastors admonish their congregations to be careful who you choose to teach you. It's a very important admonition to any church or any organization, really. Be careful who you choose to lead you because it's not always as it seems. In our story today, Jesus confronts the religious leaders in the temple, which included the Levites, who had been chosen by God to lead the people in their sacrifices in worship in the temple. But instead, they would lead the people into errors and mercilessly exploit them. Jesus instead refers to them as renters in the temple or tenant farmers, so to speak, who had the responsibility for leading the people in the temple. But it was not as it seemed. In his compassion, though, God did not destroy these fake leaders. He's giving them one last chance to recognize and repent of their errors. But let's read our story. It's in Mark 12, 1 to 12, and I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Version. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug out a pit for a wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenant farmers and went away. At harvest time, he sent a slave to the farmers to collect some of the fruit of the vineyard from the farmers. But they took him, beat him on the head, and treated him shamefully. Then he sent another, and they killed that one. He sent many others. They beat some, they killed some. He still had one to send, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenant farmers said among themselves, This is the heir, come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the farmers and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and this came from the Lord, and is wonderful in our eyes? Because they knew he had said this parable against them, they were looking for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Jesus is using ancient symbols that the priests and many of the people would understand. They were symbols from their scriptures. But I think we need to catch up on the meaning of these things. God is the landlord. The tenant farmers are the leaders of Israel, in this case, the Sanhedrin. The vineyard is the nation of Israel, the Jews. And Jesus is the beloved son. Jesus, in his parables, targets those who could understand what he was saying. He said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. But not everyone could hear. Those who were prepared to hear would understand what he meant. Actually, you know how this works. Have you ever raised your voice to a child that you were uh, taking care of, or maybe a student, would you ever say, do you hear me? 
or are you listening to me? What did you mean? You meant, are you obeying me? Or is this just going in one ear and out the other? Listen to me. But some people refused to listen to God because they hated Jesus. So this story is aimed like a cruise missile right at the leadership, the Sanhedrin. They, well, they knew they'd been hit. <laughs> they knew the point he was making. They knew they were the bad guys, the tenant farmers who killed the prophets. They were the vineyard renters. But even more maddening for them, I think, was the fact that the crowd probably understood this parable very well. Um, they knew that the vineyard was Israel. They were all familiar with absentee landlords, people who lived far away but owned the land where the tenant farmers worked. So the hard work of the tenant farmers was sent to a landlord who had never even stepped foot on the land and they were rebellious. The people were familiar with tenant rebellions in the area. They knew the point that Jesus was making. So Jesus tells a story. Storytelling, that's a cunning way of dropping a piano on someone's head and looking innocent at the same time. Jesus is a master at this. He is revealing who he is and concealing it at the same time using a story. Now, it's important to realize that Jesus is not telling this story against the vineyard itself. He's not talking against Israel, the Jews. This is not an anti-Semitic story. I mean, Jesus himself was Jewish, so it can't be. No, Jesus is aiming this at the leadership, the Sanhedrin. He's including the Sanhedrin with all the ancient leadership throughout the Old Testament who persecuted the prophets. Time after time, God sent these men to them, and they killed them and beat them and treated them shamefully. So Jesus is calling them thieves and murderers, but he's claiming that he himself is the beloved son of God. No. That is an ancient symbol, but it referred to the nation of Israel. Now, Jesus is claiming that he himself is this beloved son. It was the title given him by his heavenly father at least twice already in the Gospel of Mark. If he had said so straight out, it would have been enough to kill him. But he tells a story. Jesus is predicting in this story that the Sanhedrin will murder him. He's warning them, though, that his murder will not be the end of the story. He will be the new leadership of the nation. He will do God's will. You see, the vineyard will not be destroyed, but it will be given to people who do God's will. He's predicting that he himself will be that leader, the foundation on which the nation will be built. And with this parable, Jesus has answered the Sanhedrin's question who gave you authority to do these things. Jesus is saying that his authority was from God, the landlord. And
and he quotes Psalm 118, verses 22 to 23. This came from the Lord, and it's wonderful in our eyes. Jesus implies that if they haven't understood Psalm 118, then they haven't even read the scriptures. They are not as they seem. These priests, these Levites, they are not really priests or the scribes. They are not really experts in the law. They just pretend to be experts in the law. They are not really elders of the people. They are usurpers and exploiters of the people. They are a cabal of criminals destined for destruction. And although they reject Jesus and will kill him, he will replace them as the foundation of the whole nation. So his parable takes aim right into the heart of the Sanhedrin, their position and their power. His enemies. And they understood him, all right. But they didn't change their ways. They didn't hear him. Why? Because they didn't believe in him. No matter all the miracles he did and the wonderful things he taught, bringing them back to what the law meant, they didn't believe him. So Jesus uses a story to obscure what he was saying. Doesn't that seem strange? I've always thought about Jesus' parables and stories as illustrations to make more clear the truth he was teaching. I mean, that's what we would use it for, right? But that's not what Jesus was doing. He was using parables in a different way. It isn't what it seems. But what is the point of telling a story that only a few will understand. Mark 4, 10 to 12 kind of explains this a little bit. When he was alone with the 12, those who were around him asked about the parables. He answered them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been granted to you, but to those outside, everything comes in parables so that they may look and look and yet not perceive. They may listen and listen, yet not understand. Otherwise, they might turn back and be forgiven. But that's a shocker. It sounds as if there's some people God does not want to forgive. I think we need some more explanation of this. Matthew helps some. Matthew 13, 10 to 16 explains it this way. Then the disciples came up and asked him, why do you speak to them in parables? The them is the crowd and the Pharisees that Jesus has been telling parables to. And Jesus answered, because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given for you to know, but it has not been given to them. Whoever has more will be given to him, and he will have more than enough. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now, people have misunderstood this and thought Jesus was talking about money or possessions. But of course, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about knowledge of himself and the kingdom of God. And for this reason, he continues, for this reason, I speak to them in parables. Because looking, they do not see, and hearing, they do not understand. So Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them, which says, you will listen and listen, yet never understand. You will look 
and look, but you will never see, you will never perceive. For this people's heart has grown callous, and their ears are hard of hearing. They have shut their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes, or hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn back, and I would cure them. Jesus has been doing all these miracles and teachings among them, but they didn't see, but they were, they didn't hear what he said. And then Jesus finishes that in Matthew, but you disciples are blessed because you do see and your ears because they do hear. So Matthew's account does make it a bit clearer. He says that people who don't understand Jesus' parables have had a history of misunderstanding, of disobeying and ignoring God. So now they can no longer see what he's doing or hear what he's saying. They have shut their own eyes and ears to what he's saying. Reminds me of a song Listen while you still can hear. I put a link down in the manuscript if you want to listen to it. So the answer to that question, that conundrum, is Jesus is hiding the truth from people who have already decided not to believe in him. He's using parables kind of like coded messages. Only those who can hear, do hear. Only those who are willing to see, can see. And he calls them blessed, because they do. Now, I have another question. Why did Jesus tell this story after the whole thing about John the Baptist in the previous story? Because God is gracious. That's why, as I said at the beginning of this, he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to salvation. Jesus is giving the Sanhedrin and the religious leaders one more opportunity to change their murderous plans, but he knows they won't. They could no longer see what God was doing or what God was telling them. These were not the God-appointed leaders of Israel. These people had paid, had bought their positions of priests from Rome. They didn't care about the people of Israel. They cared about their own positions and comfort and power. Probably their income as well. The end of this story is both pathetic and ominous. You can imagine these religious leaders huddled together trying to decide what they're going to do with Jesus. They know they can't arrest him right now because we can also imagine the crowd sensing the danger for Jesus and quietly forming a circle around him as if to say, to get to him, you have to go through us. And so shamefaced, the delegation from the Sanhedrin shouldered their way through the crowd, utterly defeated and deeply furious. So today, today, what would be God's vineyard? Some say it's the people of God, which they say then is today the church. Not a building, but the people of God. The Gentiles, who constitute much of the church, 
were grafted in to the people of God, grafted into Israel, Paul says. So we too need to be careful who we choose to lead us because it's not always as it seems. That's, that's true for your church or any organization or nation for that matter, especially if you choose your leaders by elections. We must know the truth about the people who lead us, whether they're doing God's will or just appearing to by saying so. We need to be sure that they're not just appealing to our prejudices or are trying to achieve their own ambitions. Well, of course they are, right? So we need to find the truth and not believe some what some have called alternative facts. These alternative facts are just cunning lies said with such confidence. What seems to be true may not be true at all. It's not necessarily always what it seems. Like Psalms 36 verses two and three say, he praises himself so much that he can't see his sin or hate it. His mouth speak words that are evil and false. He has stopped being wise. He has stopped doing good. So be careful who you choose to lead you because it's not always as it seems. And that's especially true in our day when People can make fake videos using artificial intelligence. In my day, we, I was myself able to make people say pretty much what I wanted to say in audio by cleverly clipping together different segments of audio. And recently, we have seen that being done already in this early election campaign. We need to be careful to look behind and find but the truth is because it's not always what it seems. Is it? Be careful. 